Hey everyone, welcome back to Maple Street. The video that you're about to watch is the first of its kind on this channel. In a nutshell, the following clips you're about to see were filmed over a year ago. The first clip you're going to see was filmed in January 2023. But by the time you see me again, well, me wearing this shirt, that's when you'll know that you are back in present day. So let's go back in time to the beginning of 2023. <laughs> Hello. If you haven't noticed, I have a big pile of Criterions right here. This is it. Oh my gosh. That was definitely not supposed to happen. I have here a pile of Criterions. Jeez, that was a mess. These are all the Criterions in my collection that I've never seen. I've purchased them from Barnes & Noble sales, from Criterion Flash sales, even secondhand stores, whatever it may be. I have not watched them though, and I'm setting a goal for myself this year I want to watch them all. So right now I'm filming this video in January, but you won't see this until, well, I can't tell you until because I don't know when this challenge will end. The criterions that I have included in this pile and this challenge, if you want to say, they range from foreign language films, black and white films, even trilogies, documentaries. So I think it only makes sense to show you what movies I'll be watching, right? All right, let's do this. Ingrid Bergman, in her own words. Mirror. The Last Emperor. The Furies. The Marseille Trilogy. Showa. Army of Shadows. Magnificent Obsession. The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Limelight. Uh, I've definitely seen this movie. This is not supposed to be in here. I love The Bridge. If you guys haven't seen The Bridge, definitely watch that movie. Late Spring. Written, I almost said Wind in the Willows. Written on the Wind. Just got this for Christmas, actually. Afterlife. Love Affair. The Cranes Are Flying. Summertime, another gift that I got for Christmas. Time Bandits. Now, Voyager, Le Corbeau. I think it's the crow in French. I don't know. The Manchurian Candidate, The Baker's Wife, Camera Shaft, All That Heaven Allows, and finally, The Fugitive Kind. Hi, post video of me. I found two other criterions that fall on the ground. There's Design for Living, and camera person. These are a lot of criterions to watch and for this video I'm actually going to go in a different direction to grade them. Rather than give them like a rating out of 10, I'm solely just going to say whether or not I get to keep it or if I'm selling it. Because if you guys don't know, I have an attachment to my criterions but the ones that I don't like I do not keep. I sell those things right away. I wouldn't be surprised if I found out that I've sold at least 20 criterions in my collection. I don't see a point in keeping a movie that I don't like. And so I will be watching all of these movies and then giving you an answer of whether or not it's worth keeping. Now, of course, this is all subjective and so don't be offended if I choose to sell my movie. Also, there's a lot of movies and I feel like if I choose an order of what I want to watch, then I'll watch all the ones I'm most anticipating first and then I'll just dread the rest of the challenge. And I also thought to myself, I could just go and order the spy number, start from lowest, go to highest, but then I always know what's coming next. Like I can organize them in a, in a pile and know exactly what the challenge is. I don't want to do that. I don't want to look forward to a certain movie down the line. I just want each movie every time it's randomized. I just watch it and I don't know what's coming next. And so just like I'm doing with my 25 movies challenge season four, where I spin a wheel for my watch list, I'm going to add all these to a wheel, spin that wheel and whatever it gives me, that's what I'll watch. Before I started filming this video, I actually spun the wheel already. And so I will show you what the first watch will be. If I can find it. Oh my gosh. Of course it's the very bottom. <laughs> My first watch for this challenge will be Ingrid Bergman in her own words. This is a documentary about Ingrid Bergman, and I think that it's in her own words, if I remember correctly. Each time I watch a movie, or maybe each time I watch five movies or something, I will film another video just updating everyone on what I thought of the movie and if I'm going to keep it or sell it. I'll see you later. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's me. It's been a month since I last filmed a video, and in that time, I watched five Criterions in my collection and got a black eye. I thought about prolonging filming this so that I can wait until this bad boy heals, but then I realized, wait a second, I'm filming this in real time. I wanna be realistic with what happened in my month of January, including the time when my roommate chucked a water bottle at my face. But I have Criterions to talk to you about. I wanna give my opinion on the five that I watched and tell you whether or not I'm keeping them or selling them to someone on eBay. The first one I watched was 
Ingrid Bergman in her own words. Yes, it is still sealed. I watched it on HBO Max because in the chance that I didn't like it, I could easily sell it brand new and factory sealed. Come on. But I really liked it. Ingrid Bergman is one of the most iconic performers of all time. Having a documentary all about her, especially her early years and how she got big, how she got to Hollywood and the films that she made, the behind the scenes information, as well as her life with like her kids and everything. It was so fascinating to watch. It's a pretty long documentary. Yeah, 114 minutes, but I was never necessarily bored. Like I actually found it very cozy and I would recommend that if you want to watch this, you save it for maybe a rainy day or a day where you just want to like cuddle up in a blanket and drink some hot cocoa. But I'm going to go ahead and keep this. So after I finished in her own words, I spun the wheel to see which criterion I would watch next. And the baker's wife was the result. I didn't really know what to expect with this movie. All I knew was that his wife goes missing or leaves or something. And so I was really wondering what the movie was actually about. But what I got in the end was actually really wholesome and really good too. I just loved the community and the baker's wife. I like how they all work together to try to make sure the baker is as happy as he can be. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm trying to avoid certain details. It was also very funny, like funnier than I was expecting. And the main actor, Raymu, Orson Welles claimed him to be the greatest actor of all time. And so there's an interesting fact for you if you're interested in checking that out. But for me personally, I liked it a lot and I'm going to keep it. The next three movies are actually part of a trilogy. I spun the wheel and out of all the movies, I spun the Marseille trilogy trilogy, which is crazy, especially because Marcel Pagnol, he produced all these movies and directed the third one. So I just thought it was like really weird timing that I got both of them so close to each other. Okay, why do I always drop things in this video? The Marseille trilogy is incredible. My ranking of it probably goes two, three, one. Every single one of them is at least great. In fact, I gave an eight out of 10 to the first one and a nine out of 10 to two and three. The trilogy is very simple, like nothing crazy ever happens, but it's kind of like The Baker's Wife where you just really fall in love with a community and you get to know their personality so well. And also like The Baker's Wife, it's very funny, funnier than I was expecting. So what I'm saying is this is very similar to The Baker's Wife. So if you like The Baker's Wife or if you like this and you haven't seen the Baker's Wife. Watch them. Just watch both of them. I'm going to keep this because it's a new favorite trilogy of mine. All right. So the next time I film one of these videos, I'm, hey, uh, sorry to interrupt. I have a message for you. Okay. Uh, hi. Good to meet you. By the way, if you're wondering why I'm slouching, it's because the tripod's so freaking small. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know I have your next movie for you. So you have the movie that I'm supposed to watch next? Yeah, that's what I just said. Is it weird if I ask that I can change my shirt before you toss it? Yeah, that works. This will be interesting because you have a black guy, but when I catch it, I won't have a black guy. Oh man, I thought my glasses would mask it. All right, let's do this. Go ahead, toss it. Okay, here it goes. Afterlife. It's your time! Thank you, this just, this, this means so much. Okay, let's talk about the movie. Afterlife is super good. The basic plot is when you die, you go to this limbo sort of place and there you choose one memory that you want to hold on to for eternity. The movie is like two hours long, but I never felt the runtime. It's just a very comfortable movie that you just let happen. It's definitely no comedy. This is very much so a drama and a very philosophical movie, I would even say. And that's what I wanted it to be. I didn't want any jokes necessarily. I just wanted to enjoy this interesting take on the afterlife. I don't know when I'll watch it again, but I liked it enough that I want to keep it. Like I want it to be seen on my shelf so that people can say, hey, that afterlife movie, what's that about? You know, because so many people visit my movie collection. Oh, I'm keeping it. So between the last video I made and this video, I've only watched two Criterions, including Afterlife. And the reason for that being is the movie I spun after Afterlife is Showa. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, Showa is like a nine and a half hour documentary on the Holocaust. Any documentary that's nine and a half hours is hard to watch, but make it about the Holocaust and it's going to become even harder. I will say I've been slowly tackling this documentary. I am two and a half hours in right now. There are four parts and I'm finished with part one. So I'm a quarter of the way through. If Showa wasn't the next movie that I had spun, I am confident to say I probably would have been five movies into the challenge by now. But this has been pretty tough to tackle. The good news is I'm still watching it. I'm not giving up on it. But in March, my star of the month was Frank Sinatra. And so instead of spinning this movie, I just chose to watch it. It's The Manchurian Candidate. Let me tell you really quickly, if you want to have a star of the month with Frank Sinatra, well, maybe just don't have a star of the month with Frank Sinatra because his filmography, it's, it's very mediocre. It's not very good. He has like three, maybe four 
good movies. Luckily, The Manchurian Candidate is one of those good movies. This was my favorite watch of his filmography that I saw in March. I'm happily keeping this in the collection. The first 45 minutes or so, really the two nightmare sequences that you see at the beginning, I was amazed by them. This movie was made in 1962 and it's pretty violent for the time. It has a PG-13 rating and when you watch it, you'll be able to understand why. I was just really amazed from this movie. So amazed that I drew a picture of the Queen of Hearts in my journal the day I watched it. So Manchurian Candidate, great movie. I wish I had more movies to update you on, but we've already been through the month of February and March. Today is April 3rd. And my plan is to just continue to tackle Showa. And after that, I'll have a lot more updates. All right, Nathan, in the future, um, next time you're filming one of these, you will have finished Showa. So I'll pass the time over to you, the wiser, older Nathan. Take it away. So a few quick life updates. For one, you're gonna notice a new background that is because I moved back to Arizona, said goodbye to Utah, but I did get a job in Arizona and so moving forward, I will be here working and earning the big bucks. Okay, well, it's been a few days since I finished Showa. I'm not gonna lie, it was very hard to get through this. I mean, it was a big challenge and there were multiple times that I actually wanted to quit. It was especially around the part one, part two of the film that I realized I have so much longer to go. I don't know if I can handle these stories too. They're so traumatic and truly terrifying, but I stuck through it. I finished the documentary and I'm really glad I did, even though it took several sittings. I don't really want to recount stories that happened in Shoah. I think that if you are curious, watch the documentary for yourself. It's still available from Criterion and everything. Plus, there are so many stories to share from this that there's not one that stands out over others. They're all equally traumatic, devastating, and for lack of a better term, it was fascinating seeing the difference in interviews between Holocaust survivors and ex-soldiers and seeing the denial that these soldiers were in, knowing that they were involved with these atrocities. So as far as the verdict goes for Showa, I'm not gonna lie, I don't think I'm gonna keep this one. And let me explain why. Showa was one of the hardest things I've ever watched in my movie watching career. Finishing it one time was enough, I can't imagine I ever watch this again. And I'll be completely honest, it's a chore to get through. It's a great chore, I mean I gave the movie 9 out of 10 stars, but it's not a documentary that I ever see myself going through again. And there's a part of me that wants to keep it on the shelf just to represent the Holocaust and to honor the lives that were lost. But at the same time, it's just gonna be on my shelf collecting dust and I can honor the Holocaust in different ways. I don't have to keep this documentary, you know what I mean? And so I am going to sell this one, but yeah, objectively, this is the greatest documentary I've ever seen. Okay, so when it comes to my next movie, I, I'm sorry, does it sound like I'm softer? Can you hear me okay? Let me still see. Ah. ah. There we go. You had something in your ear. What does it say here? Oh, it looks like it's my next movie. Next movie will be The Furies. Do you remember? Did I purposely wait to film this so that I could use the 21st night of September as my opening intro? It's been a few months. I've taken my time with this challenge. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make any difference to you. I don't know how many jokes I'll have throughout this video where I acknowledge that my time's moving slower than your time. So it's been a few months and the last movie I left off of was watching The Furies. I've watched several since then and before then as well. So I kind of just want to go through all of them and I'll explain why I watched what I did before The Furies because I'm still all about that randomizing. So first I watched The Fugitive Kind. The reason I watched this was because in June I was trying to watch a lot of Sydney Lumet movies to prepare for my eventual Sydney Lumet ranking that I came out with on the channel. He directed The Fugitive Kind. It stars Marlon Brando. I owned it in my collection, so I was like, let's watch it. Let's go out of order. Let's just check it out so that I can see another Sydney Lumet film. And the reason I'm not showing it to you right now is because I actually already sold it on eBay. <laughs> it wasn't objectively bad. It's a well-made movie. I really like the score. The ending was pretty special to me, but I was just very bored and I didn't really care about any of the characters. And so it was kind of a no-brainer for me that, yeah, no, I'm not going to watch this again, post it on eBay. It sold so fast I couldn't even show it in this update. The next movie I watched before The Furies because it was June 25th, which is six months till Christmas. And so I wanted to watch a Christmas movie and I was like, hey, 
All That Heaven Allows is kind of a Christmas movie from what I understand. It was my first Douglas Sirk movie and I really enjoyed it. I found it to be very cozy and it was especially a gift, a present if you will, a Christmas present. Watching this movie in the middle of summer in Arizona because man it's so hot outside and to see snow in this and just beautiful even like fall leaves. It was such a cozy movie. I really liked Jane Wyman's character. I think her name's Carrie. There's a scene where she she kind of has this realization of like, wait, why am I letting people judge my actions? And that was like my favorite scene of the movie, I'd say. I'm keeping this bad boy. Really enjoyed it. I found it to be a great movie. And I'm excited to see more Douglas Sirk movies as well. I own two other ones that are in this challenge, Magnificent Obsession and Written on the Wind. So I'll be watching them eventually. The next movie I watched out of order was Summertime starring Katherine Hepburn. I watched it and it was fine. I really liked the setting. I liked the idea idea of this woman just getting away from life, taking a long vacation, and really treating herself. She's never done anything like this before. I don't know if I'm supposed to be rooting for the romance that's happening or against it. I always have a hard time with these kinds of movies. This, An Affair to Remember. Oh, I haven't even seen that movie. Um, what movie am I thinking of? Brief Encounter. Brief Encounter. I think in A Fair to Remember is the same idea though. These movies where, you know, they're they're cheating on a spouse or something to get together. It's like, okay, it, we, conflicting thoughts there. I've never been the biggest Katherine Hepburn fan. I think I've kind of alluded to it before in videos. So she's not doing much for me. She, I mean, she does a good job in anything I see her in. I just don't love her. As far as summertime goes, it it's really on the line of keep or sell. I'm more on the side of selling it, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and sell it. Sorry, Kathy, you didn't make the cut this time. Wouldn't be the first time I've sold a Katherine Hepburn Criterion. I definitely used to own Women of the Year and yeah, I do not own that anymore. Okay, hey, look, we finally got to The Furies, the movie that I promised months ago. I watched The Furies and I'm selling it. Uh, no, The Furies was good in some aspects. I really loved the Western genre. It's a genre I fell in love with in 2022. And so that was a good thing going for it. Also, Barbara Stanwyck gives a great performance in it. I'm not as big on Barbara Stanwyck either. I promise I do love actresses. I will say I like Barbara Stanwyck more than I like Katherine Hepburn, but her character in this is very dislikable and and I don't think she's supposed to be likable, but I think the performance that she gave was very good for it. There's a lot of characters in this that actually are dislikable. In fact, to be quite frank, I didn't really like anyone in this movie. I also thought it was a tad bit too long. And I think because I didn't care about anyone, none of the consequences or things that happened to the characters really mattered to me. I hate to say it, but it was kind of just a check off the list movie. And so I've seen it, it's done. It's already posted on eBay. Okay, after the Furies, I spun the wheel and I got Design for Living. Design for Living is an Ernst Lubitsch film. And can I just pause real quick to say what a great cover this is? I love this cover so much. So anyways, Design for Living is a love triangle movie if there ever was one. It's kind of strange, but also really funny and lovable. I think, I'm pretty sure it's before the Hayes Code. At, at least they're they're pretty uh, blunt in this movie. They, they, they don't really hold back on some things they say, but I loved it. I had a great time with this. I just just thought it felt ahead of its time and it's from 1933 so the fact that this movie that's 90 years old is funny to me and that it feels ahead of its time says a lot and I liked the characters too I thought that Gary Cooper and Frederick March I think they had great chemistry as these two guy friends and then Miriam Hopkins as the girl that they're both in love with and just really good chemistry all throughout the the three leads I really enjoyed this one so I'm keeping this one for sure all right then, after Design for Living, I spun Charlie Chaplin in Limelight. This is a movie that has grabbed my attention for years, and the reason I've always postponed watching this is because I knew what the movie was about, how it's kind of this has-been comedian, and he is at the end of his career. No one really cares for him anymore. I knew it was going to be depressing, and... I knew it was gonna kind of be an homage to Charlie Chaplin's career. And so I wanted to save this until I'd seen a lot of Chaplin films. I think I've seen about five, six Chaplin films, excluding this. And I know that's not nearly as much as I'd like to say I've seen, but because it was spun, because I'm doing this challenge, because I'm trying to watch them all, you know what? I, I said, I've seen enough. I'm gonna watch it. I'm glad I did because this is a really good movie and I don't even think you need to have seen other Chaplin films to enjoy it. I think it will help though. 
but I don't think it's a requirement. So Limelight, I kind of already explained the plot. It reminds me a little bit of Make Way for Tomorrow, another criterion in the collection, where you're going into it and you kind of have an idea that this is going to be a hard movie to watch. It's going to be pretty sad to watch, but because you're prepared for that, it kind of makes it still a comfortable viewing because you already knew to expect that. And so yeah, it definitely delivers on the sad moments, but there are also plenty of funny moments too. And I feel like just about any scene in this movie you could fast forward to or randomly skip to, and it could be a life lesson that you could write down and live by. There are so many great quotes from this movie. It was a big highlight. My only gripe with the movie, too long. Two hours, 17 minutes. Gosh, it could have definitely been shorter. What do they trim to? Down, maybe one of the performances. I don't know. I'm keeping this though. I really enjoyed it. After Limelight, I spun the movie Time Bandits. In my letterbox review, I'm gonna repeat it here because I thought it was really stupid but clever. The only things this the only thing these bandits stole from me was my time. <laughs> Cause this movie wasn't that good. It wasn't awful. It was really strange. And I think as a kid, I would have liked it more, but I also think as a kid, I would have been horrified. You know, the uh, Macaulay Culkin movie, Page Master, it kind of reminded me of that. And I'm a sucker for that movie. So, you know, going into it, I didn't know too much of what to expect and everything. And as the movie was progressing, I was like, okay, I, I, I get it. I get what's happening now and everything. It just didn't really do anything for me though. Not really good enough for me to keep. So I will be selling this one. All right. And so for my next movie, I'll be watching Mirror. November, November comes after October. So I actually just got home from work and I was like, you know what? Why not film one of the videos while I'm in my work outfit? I'm also doing No Shave November. We'll see if it continues into December. Today's November 13th, so I don't know what's happening next. So the next movie that I'm supposed to talk about is Mirror. I did watch one movie before Mirror though, so I'm gonna quickly talk about that. This movie came randomly because Dirk Bogard was the TCM star of the month in September, I believe. So I watched The Servant, which you're probably wondering, um, Nathan, where the heck did this movie come from? I bought this in the July Criterion sale. And yeah, I watched it. I, I would say I had pretty high expectations and I was a little disappointed from it. It's basically Parasite in 1963. And so I should be head over heels for this movie. But I think it wasn't as exciting as I was expecting. Maybe that's my own fault because I had high expectations. I think that everyone does a fine job in it. Movie's pretty crazy. It's just not as crazy as I wanted it to be. So... I'm gonna sell this one. Sorry. So now I'm gonna talk about Mirror, but in order to talk about it, I'm actually gonna go back in time even more so to a few days ago. I'll explain everything. Cut back to past Nathan. Thanks, future Nathan, but also the past Nathan, because when you watch this, all of this will be in the past. <laughs> I'm at the post office right now because I actually already sold Mirror on eBay. <sighs> I thought objectively it was a great movie. You know, it looks incredible, a lot of cool shots. The cinematography is beautiful. The acting is really good too, especially from this lady right here. And that's about all I liked about it. It was just a very slow paced movie. And it's weird because Tarkovsky hasn't failed me yet. Like I know that he's a director that has those long shots that he takes his time and everything. And so I don't know why Mir didn't work because Solaris is my favorite from him and that's all about slow shots i've seen stalker yeah so i am choosing to sell it i actually had the envelope right here and i'm about to package it up so back to you future past nathan Thanks, past, past Nathan. Okay, so we're back in the future for past Nathan, which is the past for you, but the present for me. Let's continue on. After Mirror, I spun the wheel and the movie I got next was Camera Person. The reason I own this to begin with is because Kirsten Johnson, yeah, Kirsten Johnson. She directed Dick Johnson is Dead, which was one of my favorite movies of 2020. Really was interested in what other movies she's directed. I'm pretty sure this is the only other one. But through the years, I've kind of lost interest in it. I think I was very hyped to see the camera person upon first viewing Dick Johnson is Dead. And I've just kind of lost interest. And so when it was spun, I'm not gonna lie, initially I was like, okay, which is too bad but also a little bit of a pro because since I went in with such low expectations, I actually really enjoyed this. The idea behind Camera Person is Kirsten Johnson has been filming things for all her life. Camera Person is a compilation of different projects she has been involved with. And so you see moments filmed across the world. You see some filmed in New York. You see some filmed, I think there was one in like Wyoming, plenty of different places and really fascinating because I knew that general premise, but I was thinking the way the movie would do it is it would spend 30 minutes in one location, 30 minutes in another, 
another location. And I'm actually really happy that it doesn't do that, that it's not just sticking to one place for uh, an allotted amount of time. No, like it goes to a place and you could be there for one minute and it'll cut to a new place. Every place you go to though, it shows where you are now. And I really liked that. I'm also giving this movie some bonus points because we get a cameo from Dick Johnson himself, my favorite guy from uh, Dick Johnson is Dead. I think if you're wanting to get a taste of just human nature and the world that we live in, watch Camera Person because you will not be disappointed. I learned a lot and I found it to be very peaceful and calming and just enjoyable to watch. And so I'm keeping this one. I'm not big on rewatching documentaries, but I do see myself rewatching this one someday. After Camera Person, I spun the wheel and I got Magnificent Obsession. First off, before I give any verdict, this is one of my favorite Criterion covers of all time. Even before having seen it, I love this artwork so much. And after seeing the movie, I appreciate it even more because I understand a little bit more why she's uh, just staring off into the distance. Didn't really understand that before. I enjoyed this one, I would say, even more than All That Heaven Allows. Both of them star Jane Wyman and Rock Hudson and are directed by Douglas Sirk, so that's why I compare the two. This one is pretty much as soap opera as it gets and I don't mean that as an insult I think if I was watching this on TV and it was done differently I would find it very cheesy and funny but because it was filmed in such a beautiful way with gorgeous colors and great performances from actors I actually really enjoyed this movie and I give it props and praise because yeah a ridiculous storyline but I ate it up solid watch that I am going to keep next movie is Le Corbeau directed by Francois Truffaut no what what am I talking about directed by H.G. Cluzo one of my favorites he directed Diabolique and Wages of Fear I had pretty high expectations because I love the other two I just mentioned it is not as great as those those two movies, but it still is solid. There's this anonymous person sending letters out to the village people that are threatening them, blackmailing them, um, accusing them of things they didn't do or things they maybe did do. No one knows who these letters are from. All the letters are just signed from the Raven, which is what Le Corbeau translates to in French. And so it's pretty interesting watching the story unfold and seeing more and more how people are being affected by these letters. It even leads one person to suicide. And so pretty big deal in this small town of people. I think the movie does a good job at laying hints here and there. There's not one obvious suspect. I do think the movie does suffer a little bit though from some pacing issues. I think it is pretty slow and the movie only runs at about 90 minutes and so for it to be slow isn't the best compliment. I enjoyed the final few minutes and the final shot especially. I think they were very well done. Okay, I'll just say it without spoiling anything when you find out who the Raven is, I think everything comes full circle and it's tied up real neatly. And yeah, there were some moments in the movie that I thought were exciting and I really enjoyed, but then other moments where I was just a little bored and waiting for the plot to progress. So going into this, I didn't know what I was gonna tell you if I'm gonna keep it or sell it. I gave it a seven out of 10, which is good in my eyes. I'm, I'm thinking in my head, will you rewatch it though? Like Diabolik and Wages of Fear, I've seen both of those at least two times. For now, I'm gonna keep it. And if I change my mind, I'll update you in another video. Okay, so as far as the next uh, uh, Can I help you? It sure is nippy out there. Cold outside, you say? Well, I'm looking at my weather app and it's 85 degrees in November, so you cold? Yep, I uh, just came in from the cold. Hmm. Yeah, so just coming in here to tell you about the next movie you'll be watching. Yeah, you know the drill. What does this have to do with the next movie I'm watching? Just want to remind you it is pretty cold out there. Okay. And I, I deal in espionage. All right, top secret stuff. I'm a spy, I'm a, a spy. I came in from the cold. Okay, so you're a spy. I'm out in public, not wanting people to know that I'm a spy. I came in from the cold. It's chilly out there. Okay, I'm, I'm catching on, I'm catching on. Okay, I know which movie you're talking about. Spies in Disguise. But the only thing is that's not part of the Criterion Collection, so this is a little awkward. I don't know what to say. No, I, I'm the spy who came in from the cold. Oh. That was my next guess, so. I'm gonna head out now. I've got some uh, secret stuff to do, so behave. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy about that. I'm happy to watch that. Seems like a cool movie. In fact, that's the next movie we're watching. <laughs> Christmas! <laughs> All right, I am opening one of two mystery criterions right now. Christmas morning. This will be added to the challenge 
of what I need to watch <laughs> or what I get to watch. Okay. Oh, nice! What is it? Which one is it? Honey! I love that cover so much. Yay! Okay, everyone, we are opening mystery criteria number two. Ooh. I have no idea what it is. Hello, Tommy. <laughs> Let's do this. Oh, cool! 40 guns! Oh, this is actually really cool. I um, literally just judged them by the covers. This is like, I thought that was such a cool cover. Side note, everyone. I got another Barbara Stanwyck movie uh, for Christmas. And so, two Barbara Stanwyck movies. This is also from 1957. One of my favorite years, if not my favorite year for movies. And so, Brooklyn, you did a great job at choosing a mystery one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ready? Let's go. It has now been over a year of doing this challenge. And when I first started it, I kind of told myself, try to have this done. I mean, my first plan was to have it done by the July 2023 sale. That definitely didn't happen. And then the November sale, that also did not happen. And now here we are at the 13 month mark. Today is February 5th, 2024. It's insane that I've been doing this for over a year. I have seen five movies since my last update. So let's talk about them now, right here, right now. February 5th, 2024, the criteria challenge continues. <laughs> the Spy Who Came In From The Cold was watched in November. I thought the beginning was very exciting. Then I thought the next 100 or so minutes were pretty boring. And then I thought the final few minutes were exciting. Richard Burton was consistently good throughout. He was kind of a star in a sense of 2023 for me. I didn't nominate him for star of the year or anything because I didn't watch a lot from him, but I saw him in Virginia Woolf. I saw him in Cleopatra. So I enjoyed him. Movie itself though, I thought was just fine. I think I wanted a little bit more from it and I didn't get that. Especially because going into it, one of the reviews is that it's like the best spy movie ever made. I can't agree with that, but maybe I just had the wrong expectations. I'm not sure, but I'm selling it. And the reason I'm not showing it right now is because I've already sold it. It's definitely already shipped out and gone. Hopefully it's been delivered to that person's house and they left me positive feedback. The next movie that was spun was the next movie I watched in November. That is The Last Emperor. The Last Emperor is one of 11 Best Picture winners on the Criterion Collection and this definitely piqued my interest and made me more intrigued to watch it for sure because it's always a good feeling to check off a Best Picture winner. The movie though was not really my cup of tea. It might have been a lack of interest in China's history or maybe I just hated following this character that was not likable in the slightest. It belongs in the club that I have personally created called Objectively Great, Subjectively Not. I can see why other people like them but I don't. I really appreciate the editing. I liked that it cut back and forth between the present and the past. I like when movies do that and I liked all the performances. It was just kind of a chore to get through. I'm sorry. It's already sold on eBay. And the next movie I spun was Late Spring. I can actually show it this time because I'm keeping it. It has the actress Setsuka Hara. I think this is the third movie I've seen from her. And anything I see her in, she's always the standout. She has this very impressive talent. I don't even know if it's something she's known for, but she's really good at delivering insults or disagreeing with someone while having a very welcoming and warm smile on her face. I picked that up while watching this and I really liked that about her. The movie itself though, I don't think this is what it was going for, but it kind of felt like a nightmare to me. Just this girl, she's 27 years old. She's still single. She doesn't want to get married. She just wants to live with her dad her whole life, but everyone is peer pressuring her into getting married. It reminded me of the Twilight Zone episode number 12 looks just like you, where like this girl doesn't want to get this operation to look like everyone else, but they peer pressure her into it. I don't know if I was supposed to get that takeaway from it, but I did, especially there's a, oh, that's kind of spoiler territory. Read my letterbox review if you want to get the full information. The next movie spun was The Cranes Are Flying. I was particularly excited to watch this because it's from my favorite year for movies, 1957. So many great movies came out that year. If you don't believe me, just look it up. And this one continues the streak because I really enjoyed this one. It was good. It was very sad too. There was a very beautiful scene towards the end that involved a juxtaposition of celebrating and mourning. And I loved that scene. 
scene so much. It's at the very end of the movie. It worked really well for me. In addition to that, there are some really cool things done with the cinematography here, specifically a scene where the camera just follows a character running up the stairs and it's a spiral staircase. And it was just a really cool scene that is later referenced in the movie. I thought that it worked really well. Cranes are flying, I am keeping it. Next, this month, February, is Betty Davis month on my channel. I'm honoring her as my star of the month. And so without even spinning the wheel, I just chose Now Voyager because it was one I had to check off the list and what better time to watch it than now. Now Voyager is interesting in that there were times that I loved it and other times where I just didn't. <laughs> the times that I loved it were when this character, Charlotte, that Betty Davis is playing is trying to become her own person and break away from living in the shadow of her mother and being controlled by her mother. I loved the movie when that was the plot. I also enjoyed it when there was a romance between her and Paul Henry, Henry's character. I don't think I'm saying his name right. I don't know. The guy who's in Casablanca. It eventually just got so melodramatic that it lost me a little bit. There's this young child child actor that comes in and she definitely has to be in the conversation of ham child actors because she hams up every scene she's in. Just like what you would picture from a child actor in a 40s movie. Oh, I'll be ever so good. I promise with all my heart. Oh, daddy, I love you so much. You know what I mean? Like, it's just this ham acting style from child actors of the black and white era. That's so funny to me. It kind of took me out of the movie a little bit. At times I appreciated it. At other times I was like... <gasps> Tina, my friend, <gasps> calm yourself, please. Daddy, I love you so much. I think it was also just the plot in general. I think it just eventually gets a little messy and it kind of just keeps adding on elements and it's like, can we just enjoy a romance movie and call it a night? Maybe that's bad of me for wanting a cliche plot. I don't know. You can't judge me. By the time you watch this, I'll have forgotten about this movie. I'm definitely joking because I'm keeping this movie, so I plan to watch it someday again. The next movie spun is Miracle in Milan. I got both Miracle in Milan and 40 Guns for Christmas, and so two more movies added to the collection. <laughs> Someday I'll finish this challenge. Miracle Milan's the next movie I'll be watching. I'll have an update for you hopefully at the beginning of March. Okay, you made it. Today is March 9th, 2024, over a year since I filmed that first video. And before I wrap the challenge up, I still have six movies to talk about. Miracle in the Land is one of those movies that was just incredibly feel good. It's a great fantasy film. You can't really question what's happening because none of it actually makes sense if you stop and think about it. But that's the beauty of it, specifically of the fantasy genre. And one thing I wasn't anticipating going into this movie was how funny it would be as well. I definitely laughed out loud a couple times, specifically in one scene where this fleet of soldiers is trying to attack and instead they break out into song. Out of context, that sounds ridiculous. This movie is ridiculous and that's not a bad thing. In fact, it was a strength. I really enjoy Miracle Milan and I'm going to keep it. The next movie I spun was Love Affair. Yes, it is still wrapped because I caught it on the TCM app. This movie was good. There was nothing wrong with it. The unfortunate side of it is that I watched An Affair to remember the remake of this movie first, and I just prefer that movie to this one in pretty much every way. One thing I will give this movie though is for being a movie coming out in the 1930s, it was very witty, very cleverly written, and it stood out to me. I simply don't see myself watching it again though because I prefer An Affair to remember, and if I revisit either of the two stories, it will be that one. So for that reason, I'm selling it. Next up was my next Christmas watch from 2023, it is 40 Guns from 1957. My friend Jackson's letterbox review sums it up perfectly to me. He says, this was kind of dope. Not sure what the plot or point of it was, but it's got some cool action. And I completely agree with that. I shouldn't have thrown my phone at that. I enjoyed the movie while I watched it, but by the end of it, I was like, huh. Okay. One thing that I think also hurt it was there wasn't a lot of star power. I mean, obviously Barbara Stanwyck was the biggest star, but outside of her, I just didn't really recognize anyone. And I think that kind of affected the movie. If Gregory Peck or Gary Cooper was the leading man, I honestly think I would have liked this more. Whenever I give these movies a seven out of 10, that's like the borderline keep or sell level. And I think I will keep this one because I could see me possibly enjoying it more on a rewatch. There were some scenes that stuck out to me 
that I appreciated. It's a bleak Western tale, but it was a good movie, I'd say. I'll keep it. The next movie was Army of Shadows, and I thoroughly enjoyed this one. This honestly is what I was hoping The Spy Who Came In From The Cold would be, just a gripping, intense, suspenseful movie that had me at the edge of my seat. I think Spy Who Came In From The Cold went more of the romance route, whereas this was just full-on, undercover, don't get caught, exciting scenes one after another. Which is funny because there actually are a lot of slow moments, but I never got bored with the movie. I was just invested. It was just such a fascinating look at living in the resistance during World War II. This is my first John Pierre Melville film. After seeing this, I'm very excited to continue watching his movies. I could see me even blind buying some of his other movies on the Criterion sale. So yeah, uh, if you haven't guessed it by now, I'm keeping this. The penultimate movie, Spun, was written on the wind. I've already gone over Magnificent Obsession and All That Heaven Allows, so I'm pretty familiar with Douglas Sirk now, at least three movies into his filmography. What I really liked about the previously mentioned movies was The Color, of course, The Melodrama, and Jane Wyman. And I I realized that after watching a movie without Jane Wyman, because this also has the color, the melodrama, it's just lacking Jane Wyman. It has Rock Hudson too. I'm not the biggest fan of him, but he was fine here. And then it has Lauren Bacall, which I'm also not a big fan of her. And I think because of those reasons, the movie didn't work for me as well as the other two Douglas Sirk movies in this challenge did. I don't think it's objectively a bad movie. I think it has some good stuff going for it, and it has a well-written script. I even like the direction it goes in. Bit of a convenient ending. It wasn't a bad movie, it just wasn't my favorite, and it's not one that I see myself revisiting, so for that reason, I'm gonna sell it. And the final movie that I watched in this Criterion Challenge that has lasted over a year was one that I bought in July 2018. It is Camerad Shaft, or Comradeship. Uh, also, it's still sealed because I watched it on HBO Max. I'm gonna cut back to the video from 2018 when I actually purchased this. Camerad Shaft? <laughs> Camerad Shaft? We're saying Wait. this. I feel like we're totally butchering this. It's a movie that's in French and hey, German. Siri, how do you say Camerad Shaft? Okay, I found this on the web for pronounced Camerad Shaft. Camerad Shaft. We're gonna go with Siri's pronunciation of it. Come here, at chef. Yeah, you thought you were only going back a year in time? Try six years. After all this time, this movie has become a myth and a legend, and it almost feels like it didn't exist because I'd only heard rumors and stories about it. But I finally watched it and checked it off the list, and it was good. I don't think it was anything mind-blowing or incredible, but it was something I definitely appreciated. The movie follows both French and German miners after one day where an explosion happens, the mine collapses, the French miners are trapped, and the movie is basically about the German miners putting differences aside and going to the rescue. For that, I really enjoyed the movie. I think it did a great job at showing a message of unity, and on top of that, it had a very memorable ending that makes you question if any lessons were even learned during the runtime. The biggest con with the movie though is that there's just not much character depth. Like beyond the story and the theme of unity, I don't think that's a huge flaw to the movie because I don't think it's going for that. I think it's more focused on the theme of unity. But I will say a big strength to the movie was any scene that took place in the mind was incredible to watch. This movie is from 1931 and you just can't help but appreciate the effects that were used and what they did to create this mine explosion, and it was great in that regard. It's definitely not a bad movie. In fact, I'm gonna call it a good movie, and I'm gonna keep it. At this point, I feel like it's an item in a museum. I've had it for so long on my shelf, like why should I change that? And with that, I've seen every movie in my Criterion collection. Wow, this has been so long in the making. Like, it felt so good to say that. Now, I want to give a few closing thoughts. And before I do, though, want to pay tribute to the fallen comrades, the ones who didn't make it out. Let's have a moment for them.
Okay, that was cheesy. In the end, I watched 31 movies for the first time. The fact that there had been that many movies neglected in my collection is insane. As far as my favorites go, in no order, Loved the Baker's Wife, Marseille Trilogy, Afterlife, Manchurian Candidate, Showa, Design for Living, Limelight, Miracle Milan, and Army of Shadows. Those were all the movies I gave a 9 out of 10 to. At the end of the day, I watched 31 movies, 10 of which were sold, and so I ended up keeping about two-thirds of the films, which I'd say is pretty good. It also goes to show what my taste is like when I'm blind buying a movie, and I like to see that I kept two-thirds of them because it shows that I kind of have an idea of what I'm doing when I blind buy a movie. Some lessons learned from this experience, from this journey. For one, I'm going to be stricter on the criterions that I blind buy. I think that is pretty clear to see. And kind of going along with that, I want to watch the criterions I do blind buy closer to when I purchase them instead of letting them collect dust for literal years. And finally, the most important lesson of it all, don't wear the same shirt two times in a row. This is absolutely surreal to me that I'm closing up this journey because I've gotten so used to making regular video updates. So thank you for sticking around for the long video for the journey. And if you're a fan of this one, I'll tell you right now, keep your eye out for a video coming in January, 2025. Thank you all so much for watching and for visiting Maple Street. I will see you next time.